wanted you to hear that over and over again because of the way that it becomes this kind of chant, the, the sort of power of saying it over and over. Now this song is a genealogy. This song is claiming a mother, a heritage, a past, and connecting it. This is ours, right? You are our, you started our freedom movement, and you said that Sister Rosa brings her into the family. It's a direct, in some ways, a very direct sense of this is our, these are our people, this is our history. She is a mother to our story, a sister to our story. Now, that's what I love about the song, and I'll talk about it again in a second. But let me just explain why I said the song is wrong. The song reproduces almost every myth about Rosa Parks that has come down through civil rights history. One and the most, most powerful one is that Rosa Parks is this nice lady who just happened to be tired one day and sat down on the bus and ma managed somehow to get herself, you know, got arrested by mistake. Rosa Parks was the secretary of the Montgomery, uh, Alabama NAACP. She was deeply involved as a civil rights activist. She knew, she cared about the political organizing that was required to help bring civil rights um, change. She knew as well, because she was secretary, that the NAACP had been looking for a test case to bring uh, a legal challenge to the segregation of the buses. And in fact, um, a young girl had refused to get up a couple of weeks before. Um, unfortunately, she was um, unmarried and pregnant, and so they decided not to make her the test case. I'm shocked, but there it is. So when Rosa Parks sat down and refused to get up, I mean, this does not change the power of it. It changes our understanding of what the civil rights movement was. It wasn't a spontaneous <laughs> thing that broke out among some people who were tired one day. It was something that took organizing, activism, planfulness, and the commitment to change on the part of people like Rosa Parks. Um, and also, uh, Martin Luther King didn't decide it was the time. Martin Luther King, at that point, was not the national uh, and world-class leader he became. He was a young preacher who'd come to Montgomery, and he was voted head of the boycott committee because he was so young and so unknown and relative, so inexperienced that they figured he couldn't get in arguments with anybody else in the, in the various, all the very more powerful ministers in the community. He wasn't on anybody's side, so he got <laughs> elected as the kind of neutral leader. Now, what he became as a result of that, of course, we all know, was incredibly um, powerful. But Martin Luther King didn't organize the Montgomery boycott. And in fact, uh, some historians have argued that it was the women of Montgomery who organized the Montgomery boycott, not even the ministers. They simply um, played a leadership role in that. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't use material like this. Material like this is a good teaching moment because it both shows why the civil rights movement might matter to people, how they connect to it, and also you can see, use it as a chance, and I like to use it as a chance to show some of the ways in which um, the myths of the civil rights movement um, actually don't do justice to the powerful political organizing that was required to make that movement work. And I'm gonna um, talk a little bit more about that with the next set of clips. All right, so. Let's then move to another example about Montgomery. So I wanted to use two examples of film and this song to talk about the different ways that um, the Montgomery bus boycott is represented. How many of you know the film long, The Long Walk Home already? Just a couple to you? Well, a lot of people. Okay, good. Um, and has anybody ever used it in teaching? No? Okay, we'll see what you think. Um, the story of a long walk home, it stars uh, Whippy Goldberg and Sissy Spacek. And it's a story of um, a woman, Odessa Cotter, who's a maid um, for the Thompson family in Montgomery, Alabama in 1955. And um, this is a story, one of the nice things about the film is it's about ordinary people, not leaders. Odessa's family is a low income, working class, solid family. Um, and the story that we, where we pick up is that the bus boycott has already been announced in Montgomery, and um, Rosa Parks has already been arrested, obviously. And so they know, as we start this, that this is the day that people are supposed to stop riding the buses. And so when the clip opens that we're going to look at, they, um, it's the morning, and we're going to see, does the bus boycott hold? Are people riding the buses? What's the story with that? Um, and then we'll go on to look at a scene that's um, set right after that outside of church.
All right, so give me a hand here. What do you, what's striking to you about this scenes, these scenes? Is there anything particularly interesting or particularly powerful when you look at this in terms of thinking about it for yourselves or thinking about it for teaching? <coughs> yeah, thanks. You get a better understanding about the boy time. It's my understanding it was more economic. It was an economic situation. Um, I think during that time they were doing a lot of marches, stuff like that. I don't think the marches were effective as the dollar bill. When you hit that pocket, you see we get people's attention. <coughs> I think the marching was, it was effective, but it wasn't effective. But then I think once the boycott came in, it became an uh, economic situation. Um, you know, the boycott was ended uh, because of a Supreme Court ruling. So, uh, though I think it did, you know, it had an effect, I think the, the really striking thing about it is the boycott itself didn't, um, didn't end segregation on the buses. It was, the, what was effective about it was that it started the idea, or it didn't start the idea, but it, it mobilized the idea of a movement or the possibilities that social activism of working together might really have. And there wasn't as much um, there were these mass meetings at the churches, but the marches and the demonstrations really don't begin to happen until a little bit later. So there's like a little bit of a lull, and then you begin to have a lot more of that starting in about 1960 with the, um, the Woolworths sit down in 1960 with the, um, the young students, which is, there's a film about that that um, is expensive, so I didn't use it today because I wasn't sure all of you would get access to it, but if you can get February 1, it's one of the best uh, civil rights films I know of. Um, but I think in terms of a, a different question, not really the one you're making, but that one of the things I would say was the ultimate limitation of the civil rights movement was the inability to adequately address economic issues. That is, when King started to begin to try, like, you know, where, when he was killed, he was going to go to uh, work with some janitors in Memphis. But that, um, that was when the, the movement began to have some sense that it was, um, there was a lot of... Um, it was, there was some incoherence. People began, it began to break apart more and more as people began to address these more kind of multifaceted, complicated issues like economic justice, which is no, not exactly the point you were making, but gave me a chance to say it. Yeah. I like that it's through the eyes of normal people. Like it's, you know, it's about the bus boycott and, and Martin Luther King's a major character who never shows up. Yeah, so they actually get to use his speech without having to have somebody imitate him or use old newsreel footage. And so you get that, I think, a very powerful mix of those two things. That's one of the things I like about it, yeah. And I like the fact that it didn't show everybody in this hurrah stance as, you know, it, it really does put a lot of pressure on the community. You do have to, there's a reason that you use the bus. And there's a reason why this is just really hard for normal people, and yet they were still Able to mobilize. Yeah, yeah. I, I, there were more people on the buses than in these scenes. You know, <laughs> this is like I, it's this kind of triumphant story of no single person got on the bus, and it was, you know, it was harder than that. But yeah, I think it does show that you know, like her feet are bleeding. It's not. You no, know, she's really wanting to get on the bus the next day. Yeah. Are you in the back? Was that you? Who's just, who's just there being part of the movement and <coughs> finding herself. That's interesting. I, I like that. I know exactly why you say that. And you don't want to just, he always has to show up in some sense, he right? Appears. It's always like, well, he is the leader. They can't tell you anything about him other than February is Black History Month and Martin Luther King Jr. is the leader. Yeah. I just, the whole, uh, the Sissy Spacek character, I just find fascinating because she is just, so disconnected from other people. You know, she's willing to go pick up her maid because she needs her on Monday, but at the end of the day, she knows, and she's got to know, that she is sending this woman walking for hours 
and you know, she doesn't need her anymore, so what does she care? And it's just mind-boggling to me that, you know, okay, bye. This, and you know, one of the stories of the film is that she actually ends up driving her around more and more. Well, yeah, and I, then, I right, the right, 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 right there. Didn't want to ruin the ending. No, it's fine. And then she goes home and the family is just so sweet. You know, the kids are bringing her her food and, you know, and it's, it's back to reality. Like, you know, so this poor woman who's, you know, raising three children, to, you know, walks for hours and hours because you didn't need her anymore. Yeah, her insensitivity, her blindness, but it's not quite blindness, right? Because you said there's no way she doesn't know what she's having her do. They are, if your students can see it, there's a lot to see in that, just that very short interaction. You, know, you can help them see it. Yeah. What, uh, what is this? Yeah, I think it was very interesting. The last part of the clip of Whoopi Goldberg was looking at her son and her husband, oh. and you know, she's realizing <laughs> that there's something more to it than just what she's doing, that it really is a, there's a big picture to the whole thing. And you could even just use a, a small little clip like that to get a point across about how broad this whole thing and how it affects the whole society. And everybody's. Well, actually, that is a beautiful transition for me to show you one more clip from the movie. So, with the son as a major character. So, yeah, you want to say something? Oh, I'm looking at Ross, but I'm, I'm looking at that young lady. She seems so disconnected. The girl, the sister? The, you know, yeah, the sister or her daughter. Yeah. And I felt like, God, as I'm sitting here, it kind of reminds me of teenagers even today sometimes they just don't get it. Uh, occasionally, you think. <laughs> <laughs> The sister of the daughter is a really interesting character because, and you'll see her now, she really is the, the resistant person and the person who's not, you know, going along for the triumphant narrative. Yeah, and I've seen this too, so yeah. I don't know where you're drawing, when you see more of her, of her, she is somewhat disconnected. Yeah, and a little bit, yeah, clueless in a range of ways. But this is one of the things I like about the movie is that she has this nice family, but she, they're not all... Um, some of them, well, there's. You have to have someone like that in all movies. <laughs> or in all families. <laughs> all right, so let's look at the next scene, uh, and you'll see why I want you to see the connections here. But this is, um, I think it's fairly obvious. The girl is uh, trying to get, she's left the house and gotten on a bus because she's trying to meet up with some friends. Some boys. I couldn't, I wasn't sure boys or girlfriends, or there's some boys definitely involved in the story.